Welcome to Learn and Flutter. This is part four of episode two. In episode two, we're looking at the block pattern. And specifically, in this part, we're gonna tie together everything that we've done so far, basically connect the dots and see what the block pattern is. So let's get started. Before we get to the code, I want to remind you where we left off. The last time we were looking at a state machine and we said that when it comes to state machine, you can send it events that determine what the next state is. And you can also extract from that state machine what the current state is. Now I'm not going to review everything we talked about with state machine because we already covered that in previous video. The important thing is that we said the state machine can be seen as a block box. And if the state machine is treated as a block box, then we can just see the events as being fed to the state machine and the state or whatever the next action is for that state is going to be emitted by the state machine. If you understand everything that I've shown so far from futures to stream to state machine, then you already know the block pattern. I'm making the bold claim that a state machine and the block pattern is one and the same. So here's a block. And notice what I've just done. I've simply changed it from state machine to a block. So this is our counter block. And these are the three events that we're going to support. And inside this black box is where we're going to keep track of the counter. And when the value is incremented, when we see, we increment the value when we see increment event. We decrement the value when we see a decrement event. We reset the value, the counter value, when we see a reset event. And every time our counter is modified, whether increment, decrement, or reset, we will spit out the current counter value. And so if you don't believe that, that is a block and it can be adapted to much more than just keeping track of counter. Look at this other block. This is a block for our shopping cart. We can say that this state machine doesn't expose events, but rather exposes some methods that you can invoke on the state machine. And so we might have an add event method that you can call on the state machine. And again, every time our shopping cart change, we'll just emit the current items in the shopping cart. I mentioned that when you modify the state of a state machine, we have a way to get what the current state is. For us, programming in Dart, we've already looked at streams. And so we, we're really saying is that the output of our block, which is a state machine, is just a stream. And of course, the, the output is driven by what events were fed on the input. What's coming out of the state machine? Well, it depends on what type of data we want. Now, it could be single value each time the state machine changes, or it could be a collection of data, like in the example of cart item. Every time we add an item to our cart, we're going to get a list of items. The only thing I want you to take away right now before we look at the code is the idea of a meta-driven block. That's a block where... We know that we're going to always get like cart items out, for example, but we're going to use these individual methods to drive the state machine, or whether we're going to go with an event driven model where we still get cart items, but we can just use this one method called, for example, on event, and then you can provide it with the different events. I only want you to keep this in mind because you might see different people do different things when you look at their code. And of course, you should be aware of the flexibility. Let's take a look at some code. Enough illustration for now, and we'll come back to some illustrations later. So here I am in my terminal and I'm looking at our project directory for learning Flutter. And because this is episode two, I'll change to episode two directory and I'm doing part four. So in part four, I, it, my part four directory is empty, but I'll start up my Visual Studio code in this directory. The place where I'd like to start is with the last bit of code that we had. So let me do that. So let me copy the last exercise we had from part three. So we can see that oh, there, were, there were four exercises. Okay, let's copy the last one and let's copy that to part four. So we're gonna copy it here 
and uh, let me just call it exercise one okay so this is our exercise one so our exercise one is the last exercise that we started with which we're going to now modify that state machine into a block so this is our example from the last time and so we can see that we have some events we have the state and you know we had rules about when you could move through different state the example i want to implement is the one with the counter so if you remember when we were doing the counter we only had three events we had an increment event decrement and reset event so let's create that now let's think about the state here we have representation of state and then the state machine just move the current state through these different states right well, what is going to be our state when we're talking about a counter? Well, let's just create a class for now to abstract what a state or state is. And I just said that our state actually maintains a counter. Okay, so there's our counter. So when we create our state, we want the counter to have a value, and that value should be zero. That's one way to write a class with a constructor, which means anytime we create a state, our constructor is going to run and give or counter value to value of zero, which makes sense. That's where we want to start up. So here we have a state variable already to represent, represent the current state of our state machine. And of course, let's change this from state machine. to let's call it a counter block. So there we have our counter block. We don't need to worry about transition because this is not that type of state machine. This is much simpler. But what we do have is that when you create a new state machine, which is our block, remember, state machine and block one and the same. That's exactly what I did. I literally renamed state machine to counter block. So when we create a new state machine or a new counter block, we also want it to properly initialize its variable. So in this case, it's going to be properly initializing the state variable. Now, the reason why we have to do this is because in Flutter, all variables our references so this is a reference that is nil or null rather so we have to create a new state object and assign it to our variable otherwise so that when we try to invoke a method like or property on this variable it will be null and we'll get an exception okay so what about our state when you think about what our current state is when we want to get the state or is our function uh, get state when we get the state, well, we're really just returning an integer, right? So for now, we'll just say we're returning an integer, and that's going to be the counter. We'll see how to turn this into a stream, because remember we said is that what's coming out of the block is a set of values continuously that somebody can register and listen for. And since every time a value could come out from it, we don't want to have to call get state, but rather have somebody maybe subscribe and listen to those values. We have that set. Um, we have our on event, and our on event doesn't need to check and see if we have a valid transition. This is a much simpler state machine. We don't care about the old state, and therefore we're not going to print out anything about the state transition. And the only thing we have to do with now is what happened when we see the one of the three states that we support. So let's fix that. All right. So now we handle our three different events. I decided instead of saying state that zero, um, counter equals zero, might as well just create a new state variable, which is going to take care and guarantee that if I have any complex initialization for a new state, well, that's going to be taken care of by just creating a new um, state object. And so the only thing we have to worry about now is in main. Main, we create a new state machine or block. And then, of course, we don't have start anymore. So we have increment and we can get the current state and then we can do increment again. And again, we can get the current state and let's do decrement and maybe another increment and then reset. So there we go. So increment and then reset. And so we should expect us to see um, one, then two, then one, then two, then reset, um, zero. So let's run that. All right, so it looked like we have something that was set null. So let's see, uh, where was this? So main 51, 51, so we do increment, 
and so on increment we have the state variable and oh okay come to block oh a mistake i wrapped a function within a function so that is definitely a problem <laughs> oh that's silly um that's because uh, dart has nested functions so this was my constructor and i need to initialize my variable what i did was i wrapped i had a function within this function and that is what was set in the value but nothing called that function that was in my constructor so let's clear up clean up and see all right so there we go and as you can see like we expect one two one two and then zero so reset so this looked just like a state machine but is our block if you aren't convinced yet that this is a block just bear with me and let's move on and i'll show you that it is a block so this is a rather simple example so let's try something a little bit more complex and so this time what i would like to do is let's copy this example paste it and so if you think about how you would use a block you'd use it in your dart application and like i said before is that you want multiple parts of your screen to be able to subscribe to those events because if you have something like a shopping cart you might have the little widget up at the top showing you how many items are in your cart and then need to subscribe to any changes in the shopping cart from the shopping cart block but also you might be on a screen that actually lists the items of the shopping cart on the side in a small side window or something like that and so that also needs to see um, be able to subscribe and so these two different parts of your application need to be able to get messages from or subscribe to the same data that's coming out of your block so let's change our code a little bit so if you notice we're calling get state but we know about stream why don't we just return a stream of integers right so how do we now take these individual values and return them as a stream so before i answer that let me come back up here and what we'll do is we'll use something called a stream controller. Now, in order to use a stream controller, we need to import the Dart in async package. Okay, so what does Dart async package give us? Remember, we were able to use futures and all those things without having to import anything. But now, with the async package, we get a few more things. So, for example, we know to create a stream from like a list of item or something like that. But we want something better. We want something that would eject um, integers on demand when we want it to. And so if we import that async package, we have something called access to something called a stream controller. Now, I'm not going to get into exactly what a stream controller is, but I'll show you how to use it. So in our counter block, we're going to have something called a stream controller. And of course we should initialize our stream controller we can initialize our stream controller to say that oh we're creating a stream controller that's um is dealing with ints and that would be great and so for example when we come down here to get state rather what we can say is this is called get stream not get state but rather get stream and what we can do is return a stream so stream controller, we don't return the stream controller. The stream controller has on one end, it's sort of like it's a pipe itself. Like if you do go, a stream controller is like a channel. On one end, you can add events. And then on the other end, you can listen to a stream. You can get a stream from that stream controller and subscribe to it. So that is what we want to return. We want to return the stream that's associated with the stream controller. By returning the stream that's associated with the stream controller, then users can subscribe to that stream. And so therefore here, when we create this counter block, what we can do is instead of having to ask for the current state, we can simply subscribe to it. So we can say get stream that listen, and we can listen for data that arrive on that stream, and then we can print it out. Very, very straightforward nothing fancy what this means is now we can get rid of all of these methods that we have here we no longer need these guys 
since we subscribe into that stream, whenever something changes, it'll just call that method. So now we don't have any error in our code, but this still wouldn't work. And the reason it wouldn't work is because we created a stream controller. We can return the stream associated with that stream controller, but how do we add data to that stream? And so for that, we can come here and after we finish updating our state before we return, well, no, we don't actually need a return statement, but before we return, what we can do is add something to our stream. So stream controller that add, and we can add the current value of our state that counter. And so we can add that to the stream and that causes it because we just add it to the stream, it causes the stream controller to push it out to that stream that's attached to the stream controller and whoever is listening on that stream, well, they will get notified. So let's run the code and see, and the result should be exactly the same as what we had before. And there we go. As you can see, we have one, two, one, two, and zero. So remember what I told you, a block is just a state machine. And I literally turn a state machine into a block. And the only thing we've done is for the output, instead of asking what the current value is, we simply change that to a stream. And so now we can listen to it. There's only one problem with our code though. It only allow one subscribe to subscribe to it. And that's because a stream controller only allow for one, a single subscriber. If you want to be able to support multiple subscriber, then you need to do a broadcast. So that's easy. We can do it like this. That's all there is. And if you read this, it'll tell you it's a controller where the stream can be listened to more than once. Chances are when you implement a block, you will most likely want to do a stream controller that broadcasts because you're going to want multiple widgets in most cases to be able to listen to that stream. But so if you look at this, you'll see it. Oh, this is a stream controller that's parameterized on dynamic type. We want something that's parameterized on int. So to do this, if we run our code, we'll see that oh, the result is the same. And so there you go. How do we know that our oh, multiple sub listeners can subscribe to this stream is because we can do this. So let's make sure that we can support multiple subscribers or multiple listeners. And if we clear our screen and we rerun, we should see that our both of our listeners get the exact same value. And we don't have to worry about when they're called, but just know that they will be called anyway. Okay, so that is our simple counter example. Okay, so let's implement our next example, which is the I, the shopping cart. So I'll speed through that because it's so similar to this example. Okay, so now we've finished the code, let's review. So my events this time, there I went with the approach of just submitting events. So I defined some events and I have the item that I'm gonna be sending along with an event. So this would be to add an item and this is the description of what this is, what an item look like. And my shopping cart, again, is just a state machine, but we call it a block. And this time my state, I don't actually need a class to represent state. If my state was more complex, then I could wrap that in a class. But in this example, my state is simply the list of items. So that's what it is. And we're still using a stream controller because we want to be able to operate both ends of that thing, you know, be able to insert something into the stream and then have users be able to register. And since we want to support multiple subscribers, we're going to use a broadcast. I changed things a little bit. Instead of parameterizing the stream controller here, I create a stream controller of the type I want. And notice I don't get an error, even though when I create the stream controller here, I, it's not parameterized, but look carefully. You see that oh, it does return the correct stream controller. So that's Dart being nice and helpful based upon the variable that we are assigning. When it comes to 
return in the stream well of course we know how to do that that doesn't change except that we know returning a stream of list of item and next thing we had to change is of course what happened when we get events now since i have this one method that i'm exposing on my block to handle events well i need to be able to handle the case when uh, like we remove all we don't really need to specify um, anything any parameter so this is how you do an optional parameter in dart and so that allows me to call on event with just the event alone without specifying a parameter but then notice that when i have to do things like add or remove item i need to specify an item of course i can do some validation which i don't have any any validation here but notice how this is so similar to what we had before with the counter because this stuff is so flexible and we're going to get back to that soon all right so finally in our main we don't do anything new here we change what our listeners do with the data when they get it from the stream but it's the same idea we have two listeners in this example again imagine that you could have multiple parts of your ui that's subscribing to that screen of course your application could have multiple block blocks also so don't think you have to pack everything into one block and then we try to create some item, add it to our shopping cart, and then the user changed their mind and they want to remove the milk. And then of course, I want to clear the entire cart. So let's run this and see. And if you look, you'll see it all, number of events, cart and events. So these are my two listeners, but they don't seem to be getting any value. So what is going on? Well, let's, um fix i'll leave this as an example and i'll fix it in a copy of this just so for your reference so copy and paste and in example four let's fix the issue so let me clear my screen and so the problem is this when we say that we want to add a state for some odd reason dart is not making a copy of the all the elements in this list and providing it and adding it so even though we're getting triggered that something was added it's actually empty even though this is not empty we've added values to it and i can prove this because what i found is if we do state that to list and we essentially we take our which is already a list of items our state is already a list of items and now when we say to list this creates a new list and we add in that to the stream controller and this works. So this simple change, just adding to list here, makes our application start working now. So now when we do this and we run, we can see it's a one item in our shopping cart. And as you can see, we have two items, three items, four item, but of course the number of items here in our shopping cart when we empty it is zero. The problem though is that here, when we try to remove something from our shopping cart, we're not supposed to have milk. And the problem here is that what we've done is we've created an object with its own ID or memory location or reference. We add that to the shopping cart. And then when we say remove, it's looking for a object with a different ID because we've created a new object here. So what we really need to do is to do something like this. And this is just basically just to make sure that oh, you're aware of how you're storing things. So we want milk or we want to use the reference to store the milk. And when we want to remove the milk from our shopping cart. Now, in a real application, you will use, you know, each one of your items will have like a unique number, um, like an ID. And so therefore, when you go to remove things from a shopping cart, you're going to remove it by ID and so on. So there are ways to get around this problem. But at least I still wanted to show you. And so now when we rerun our application, let's clean up and rerun. You can see that how oh, we remove an item successfully, we're down to three, and then we clean up our shopping cart. So, okay, this is pretty much everything you need to know about a block pattern. If we, you understand all of this, you've got it. There are a couple of things I wanna show you. So first, if you really understand it, test your understanding by copying example for doing this exercise test your understanding by doing this exercise exercise five i want you to change this so that instead of saying 
on event, what you're going to do is instead say add item like this. So you're going to make these into method calls like this. And this, of course, is just going to be remove. And so if you can make this code work correctly, then you sort of understand every, everything we covered today because I went over this idea of your block being able to either support a single method that to accept events or if you're going to take the approach of just exposing methods. Remember I said event-driven or method-driven. So convert this shopping cart block to method driven and that's it that's your exercise okay and so let's wrap this up by looking at some of the flexibilities that you get with a block so what i one thing i want to talk about is some of the flexibility that this block pattern give you and how you can implement your block we said no that how you can inject events and we also know that how things are going to come out the other end of it so we know how you can have some logic to drive your state and that logic is going to be responsible for injecting things into your stream. Of course, you're gonna have events coming in and we can imagine that they are also coming in into a stream. Even if you don't implement a stream to capture those events, you can imagine that oh, they sort of coming in as a stream just because you know whether it's from one method or multiple methods, you could just imagine that oh, you have a number of things coming in and that's gonna drive your logic. Now, this is interesting because what this means is that let's imagine that you want to do a block for a stock trading application. And so we know that how we can accept a number of events about stocks and they're going to come into our application and we're going to have some sort of state logic. But we don't have to have just one state logic. We can have three different state logic, for example all being fed with the same set of information that's coming in. And what our different state logic could do is output those to different streams. So for example, as we get stock information, we could have a stream that's suggesting the top five stocks that um, are moving up or moving down or whatever. We can also have another stream that is just spitting out the average price. That's all it's doing. That's calculating from that information. It's calculating but not the average price. And I'm showing you this because I want to show you the flexibility. You don't have to have multiple blocks, but you also don't have to stick everything in a block. So you have all this flexibility. So things that are related like this, where from the same information, you might be deriving different sort of conclusion. You might want to put it in the same block. And um, you might have yet another one that is making suggestion on what to buy or what to sell. And so different parts of the application now could subscribe to the different streams and present that information. This is really, really, really cool. And I really, really like the block pattern. But remember, everything I'm showing you, without even going into example, if you followed up to the, the coding example, it should be easy to extrapolate this much. If you're having problems, let me know and I'll try to find some other way of explaining it. So we sort of talk about the flexibility and we've talked about, you know, there are events coming in on the left hand side and then there are streams, one or more streams on the right hand side. But we haven't really spent much time talking about who's stimulating the in events and who is really um, responsible or listening to those streams. I mentioned it sort of, I said, like in the case of a Flutter application, that's going to be your widgets subscribing to the streams because whatever come out the block, they're going to have to update what they present to the user. Well, on the left hand side, you have your actors and those actors could stimulate any one of your inputs. Right. And so you could have multiple actors here. You can have the user as an actor pressing on buttons. You can have your network, right, acting as an actor. So let's say you have some timer that periodically goes out to the network and fetch weather data. And when that data is available, that is the thing that's triggering um, input into your block. And not to mention, because your block is a black box, right? Your block, BLOC, is a black box. That means that uh, when you have stimulation from the event, you can in turn go out to the network. There's nothing that says 
that when you get an event, you couldn't, for example, augment that data or enrich it by going to your backend service or going out to some network service, getting some more information, and then, you know, um, before you take some action and you spit out. So because everything is enclosed, you can do anything you like. And on the right-hand side, those subscribers who are listening with megaphones, basically, for things to come out of your block, well, they're going to take it and do whatever they want with it. But they don't all have to use that information in the same way, right? So I sort of wanted to end it here. Uh, I don't want this to be too long. Um, we have one more video on Black Pattern. The only reason I'm doing the next video is because when we use the stream controller, there's something that we sort of should take care of. And I ignore that. And if you really want to take a jump, get a jump on it, just simply read the documentation of the stream controller and you'll see exactly what it is that we didn't handle. And so that's what I'll do in the next video. Okay, take care. See you in the next video. Bye.